So this is the 11th of 12 lectures. Uh, one more next week, and then we'll get together for the final. So as you can see here, today we're going to look at eye movements. And again, uh, it might surprise some people that in a sensory physiology course we'd be doing eye movements. But as we'll see, eye movements are very important for vision. Um, it, yeah, we'll see that the eye movements do a lot to improve your vision. One of the things about the iPhone 6 is that it has this called cinematic video stabilization that I'll show you in a minute. And uh, so it keeps your st um, movies steady. And it how it does it, it has a little gyroscope. Well, all, all iPhones have gyroscopes so they can measure how much the, 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 the iPhone is moving. And... Um, and as a consequence, it can stabilize the image that, uh, that is being recorded. Now, if you might recall that you do the same thing with your VOR. Your, your vestibular system is a gyroscope, essentially. It's, it measures how much your head is rotating or translating, which is what, exactly what a gyroscope does. And it turns your eyes to counteract any movement of your head. And um, that's exactly what the iPhone 6 does. It turns the image on the, the, that the camera is taking so that it's stable on, on its, the back of its retina, the, the image thing. So here's, a, here's an example of a movie that you can see here. This, this is one guy riding on a bicycle taking a picture of somebody else. And notice how stable that image is, even though he's, he's hand-holding the camera on a dirt path. So it took uh, the iPhone 6 to, to come up with that. But of course, um, the VR has been doing that for many, many, many millennium. OK, Let's, let me demonstrate some more how, how, how good the uh, um, how, how it helps, how, how, how it helps you see. Uh, you know that um, we have this fovea, and in this fovea is the only place that you can see in detail. So what I'm going to show you is um, on, um, a, a test to examine your acuity in your periphery. And I want you, again, um, to, to, with enthusiasm, hit the table as hard as you can. Uh, when you see a C and not an O, okay? So, uh, we'll start. So, stare at this X, and uh, while you stare at this X, you'll see this or this, and can you make out the O? Hit. Nope. 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 <laughs> so we do that again. I give you pr more practice. I just heard one table. Good. <laughs> well, so a few more tables got hit, but it's it's amazing. I mean, it is. It, it it seemed like at the end the letters were getting bigger, but that's not the case. They're they're the same size throughout, and uh, and it it you're your eye is truly unable to make out characters much beyond very close to that X. Okay. So, the, what's the other thing? So the other thing it does is whenever something moves on the eye, it stabilizes it. So it could move because the object's moving or because you're moving, such as with the VOR and that's that stabilization system that you have. So I'd like to try something else. So again, it'll be the similar test. I have to read this. Again, it was kind of hard to read, no, while it was moving. So again, it, this is why you need 
you need stabilization. It was moving a little too fast for your eye to pursue it. If it was moving a bit slower, you could probably make it out somewhat. But even then, the, the pursuit system isn't very fast, especially for something that's unpredictable like this. If it was moving in a straight line, uh, even at that speed, you could probably follow it. But because it's so unpredictable, the eye doesn't know where to, you know, land and, and predict where it, where, it, where it be. So, so what 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 we have is a bunch of eye movement systems that um, try to achieve this function let you see clearly. And each of these systems has a unique function and, um, and, and it, that the assets that that function provides is suited, or the assets that has a solve is suited to that function. But we'll see in each, each of these that, that, that how this, this thing works. So, saccades. You've heard of them many times in the course now. And they, they whenever something appears in your periphery, um, the idea is to point both fovea at the object. So that's what you use, for example, to look from word to word in a sentence. And the vision is very poor during the saccade. You're almost partially blind. Um, and so what the brain does is try to minimize the time it takes to make a saccade. And so it makes this one of the fastest, the fastest movement the body can produce. And it does so by activating these, these muscles with firing rates of about a thousand degrees per second. Okay, I want you to maybe pair up if you can, and we, we'll do some looking at each other's eyes. Okay, if you're paired up or tripled up, um, um, get, get near someone. There's someone behind you there. You're just behind you. Uh, yeah, you two get together. Uh, the three of you get together. Okay, so what I'd like you to do, do is, it, as a pair, um, look, one, one of the pair, put up your fingers, and the other of the pair, look between those two targets. Okay. And look at that eye movement. Can, can you see the eye move during this cat? Maybe, can you turn the lights up here? Can you see your eyes move during the cat? If you can, there's something wrong. The eye is moving so quickly that it's almost impossible to see it in flight. You just see it land in one spot versus another spot. Now I'd like to try, try something really special. Try to move, you can move your hand quickly or slowly, right? But keep it still, but just try to make the eye movement slowly. Okay, see if you can do it. Try to make a slow eye movement. A slow saccade. What happens? Can I raise your hands if anyone can make a slow saccade? Or has seen a slow saccade? No, that, it, it's, it's interesting. The, 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 the saccades have one speed, fast, and that's it. You can't. You can change its speed, unlike our movements. Okay, the next one to try is this one. It's going to be harder. Okay, that's called a virgin's movement. So you're going from far to near, or the other way around. And how do these look? Look again. Pair up with a neighbor, and try to make a movement from one to the other. Try to make it as close as possible. 
you'll see when you're at, looking at it that what the figure you're looking at is single. The figure that you're not looking at, you see double. Because there, there's a disparity there. What's the difference between these virgins movements and the saccades you saw just a minute ago? Can you see me make a virgins movement? Do you see my eyes move? You don't see my eyes move? Let me look. Here. Maybe my eyelids blocked it. Okay, I'll take off my glasses. That'll even improve things. Do you see it? Okay, how are they different? Slower, yes. You could actually see my eyes move, whereas as a cat, they're in one place or the, the next place. So they're slower. That's not another difference. Kind of obvious, even this picture. Yes, they're moving in the opposite directions. Okay. So you're contracting different eye muscles to do this. Again, the, the, the function here is to point both eyes, both phobia, at the this, this single object. But now it's moving near and far. But again, the, it's like the cats, they're aiming the phobia at the object you want to look at. But they're slower. Okay. Now we have pursued eye movements. So if you could just move your finger slowly back and forth, nothing spectacular should happen except your eyes should move back and forth. Okay. Now I'd like you to try, no, don't look at, the, at that dot moving back and forth, but just look at the back of the front of the room and make pursuit idle. I'm trying to make a pursuit idle. What do you see? Saccades, yes. Now, now it, it, you cannot will a pursuit eye movement without a moving target. Or as we see, we'll see later, um, imagining a moving target. You can train yourself to imagine a moving target by a variety of techniques, but you can't do it just on the basis of a, of a, without practice. Okay, the next thing is the VOR. Again, now to make a VOR, you just turn your head back and forth. Here we have the, the eyes translating from side to side, but for me it's easier just to turn the head back and forth and generate a VR. And you should see the eyes still in, in space, like pointing at one thing only. Okay? Now, they, they looked it's very similar to the movements that you produce by looking at your finger. You know, nice smooth movement. But they're very different. Uh, one is driven by the short reflex, the VOR, and the other is driven by the pursuit system, which you'll we'll see in a moment. Now, to uh, demonstrate this more clearly, um, if you've got a piece of paper, uh, first of all, just look at that piece of paper. Uh, and, and then shake your head back and forth and see how much you can read while you shake your head as rapidly as you can. And you can find that even if you shake your head quite rapidly, you can, you can make out the letters because your VOR is so good. Now, if you take your piece of paper and shake it at that same speed, 
it won't be as good. You could just shake your paper fairly slowly and you can't see it. Now, so the, when you shake your paper, it's the pursuit system that's working. When you shake your head, it's the VOR that's working. So there's something different about the VOR and the pursuit system. And the, the difference is the pursuit system has to go, the signal has to go through the eye, through the cortex, and through all kinds of circuits within the cortex, and then back out again as a movement. That's a, a much longer reflex than that simple little VOR that went from your uh, gyroscope in your ear out to the eye muscles just through a small brainstem. Okay. One other thing about the VR that you can demonstrate to yourself, close your eyes and lightly move your head back and forth. Try moving it just a little bit back and forth and feel it. Just it's a small little rotation of the head. And what do you feel? If you make a big rotation in your head, it'll be different from a small rotation of the head. What's the difference? <coughs> can, can one of you describe what you feel? Eye movements, yes. Your eyes move, but in both cases, or is the movement different from when you move it just a little bit from when you move it a lot? But what's the difference? Yes, there, there's, there's a bang, 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 bang. Whereas if you move it just a little bit, it just wiggles back and forth. So that's, uh, we'll, we'll look at that later, but, but when you move it just a little bit, it's the VOR that's shaking it back and forth in time to your shaking of the head. So just the VOR. When you move it a lot, of course, the eye can't move that far. So it makes a quick saccade in the opposite direction to interrupt the VOR. But anyways, it shows that the VOR doesn't need vision for it to turn the eye. It's, of course, it's better, we saw, with vision uh, helping it, but uh, it can turn the eye quite well without vision. And the last thing is this optic and egg reflex. Again, we saw that uh, last week, and it's uh, if it's a big um, object that's moving, it'll generate a sensation of self-motion that you're moving. Um, and... Um, one way the, the clinicians test it is to put you, get, a, get this drum that fits over your head, and they'll spin the drum, and you feel like you're moving in the room, uh, especially if you're sitting on one of these chairs that could turn. Okay, so what moves the eyes then are six muscles, or three pairs. It's somewhat similar to having three pairs of canals. Uh, and in fact, the, the canals match the muscles. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between canals and muscles. But, so we have three canals, notice sense rotation in every direction. And we have uh, three muscle pairs uh, to do the same thing. They will turn the eye, no matter which way the head is turning. Now, when the eye is stationary, like it is now, um, its muscles are still active. So there's tension on all the muscles. To look somewhere else, some other place, look to the side, laterally, um, one muscle contracts and its opposite uh, relaxes. And as I said, there's three pairs, one for horizontal and one vertical and one torsional. Let's look at these for each one. This is called the lateral rectus. The nose is as you, as uh, is is on the left side of the screen, and the lateral 
side is, is um, on, on the outside of your head. So that turns the eye called abducts or temporally. This muscle, the medial rectus, adducts or turns it towards the nose. We then have the superior rectus, which lifts the eye, it <coughs> elevates it. But also, if you look at this little line here, you can see that it, that little line is turning towards the nose, okay? With vertical in the middle, okay? You see it's vertical here, but up here it's turning towards the nose. And that's called intorsion. Oops. And whereas this thing puts it down, and it causes a little extortion, turns it away from the nose. This, one, one way of looking at this is, another way of describing that is, um, it turns it in, in a, this is a clockwise direction, so the way a clock face would turn, and the op, one other one was a, a counterclockwise direction, the opposite of, one, of how a clock would, would turn. And finally, we've got these two muscles back here. And this is uh, a bit odd because what it basically does is turn it towards the nose. It rotates it primarily about a socket. So it, and that ha helps you whenever your head tilts in that direction or that direction. But it also depresses it a little bit. Okay? So you can see that the eyes look a little down when it's contracted. And its opposite, the inferior ob oblique, does a lot of turning. It's called extortion or clockwise, but also lifts the, the, the direction of gaze a bit. So with those muscles, you can turn any which way the head happens to be turned, and you can keep it stable in space. And, and this is the one that the, the, the reflex that works for horizontal, but a similar reflex works for each of the directions. So you've got the vestibular nucleus, the motor neurons in the sixth nerve nucleus, the muscles in the cells, <coughs> and this is the muscle that, that contracts the medial rectus. Okay. Now, what happens when you turn then, you get activity in this horizontal canal, activity in this pathway to the muscles, contraction of these muscles, and the eye turns the opposite way. Great, so you can see that during the turn, the eye is stable in space. The eye is still, okay? you can see the eye is still in space. So everything's clear on the back of the eye. But notice what happens after the turn. So let's say, try, you, you, you turn your head. Look, look, try to look at the screen and turn your head. Your eyes stay there after the turn. Okay, none of it is drifting back. How does it do it? Well, how it does it is from this an indirect pathway. There's another pathway involved. And this other pathway is the indirect pathway, and it goes through this nucleus, which has got this long name, the nucleus propositus hypoglossi, PPH for short. And what this neuron this neuron does is it maintains a tonic activity to keep the muscle contracted and looking in that direction to hold it in that eccentric gaze. Okay. So if, if the eye turns and that, that muscle is holding it there and that muscle is maintained by activity coming from the PPH. So there's two pathways. One is the phasic signal. That 
turns the eye. That actually makes the turn. Okay? And then, in addition, there's a tonic activity coming through the PPH that keeping your eye in whatever position happens to be at, at the moment. Holding it there. Okay, so that was the VOR. Now let's look at how saccades are generated. And we saw a lot of that before. Uh, we, we saw that, that it's only the fovea that reads in detail, and we had that little test about the ONCs to demonstrate that with certainty. This is trying to simulate what the, what you see while you make a, a saccade from one word to the other word in a sentence. You can see that, that, that the, the letters of a single word are only clear around the point at which you're, po you're, 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 you're pointing to, you're making your saccade to. Also, you can see that as you move, everything gets blurred. Okay? During the saccade, everything gets blurred. You can't see anything. That's why, again, you, you try to make these movements as quickly as you can. And again, there's a phasic burst, burst of action potentials at this 1,000 hertz for action potential per second frequency that does the movement. Well, where does that burst come from? Oh, first, a little, little, little quiz. How many of these things do you think you make a day? More than 1,000? More than 10,000? More than... 100,000. Which one is it? This one, yes. You make 170,000 saccades a day. That's a lot of saccades. Now, you don't make that many um, of anything in a day, unless maybe if you walked all day. I don't know. I, I've never counted steps. But I doubt even steps you can make that many a day. Yeah, and uh, and imagine if they were all slow. I mean, you'd be, you couldn't see for all that time. So where does it, what produces it? Well, there's another long name for a structure that produces it. It's called the PPRF, the paramedial pontine reticular formation. That's the structure, and it's near this structure, which is the nucleus of the sixth nerve. And again, you can see it's like the VOR. One burst to this thing goes to this eye and through another interconnection to the opposite eye and cracks these two muscles. So both eyes turn together. There's another, this is on, on the left, that turns the eye to the left. There's another mirror image of this on the right which turns the eyes to the right. Okay, but like the VOR, we need an indirect pathway. If you make a saccade to look over there, you want to keep the eye over there. You don't want it to drift back. And in order to do that, you have to go through that, the same structure, the PPH, to convert this burst of activity, this phasic signal, into a tonic signal that then holds the eye position, keeps the eye contracted, keeps the eye muscle contracted. Okay, let's make sure you clearly understand that. Okay, the lesion is here. This is what a normal saccade looks like. You're steady, fixating, quick eye movement, fixating. These are possible eye movements that you make with this lesion. Which of these do you think it is? Number one. Number two. Number three. Pittance of, of people want to want to commit themselves to this. No one's gonna look look badly at you if you hit your arm 
at the wrong time, okay? This is an 11th lecture. By now, we know each other quite well. But anyways, yes, let's see. That's correct. This is what would happen. Again, what would happen is the same thing as the VR. You could hold your eye in that position, and you'd make the cat a perfectly normal cat, and then drift back to where you started. Okay, let's see if we can get another one with a little bit more vigor. So what we have here is a small lesion of these neurons here that, 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 that signal provide a signal for these two muscles. If this is a small lesion, which of these eye movements are produced? This one? This one? This one? Okay, the majority said this. The answer, unfortunately, is no. What you, you would try to, you, you, you would try to make this burst, okay, but you would not go very far because this muscle is weaker than normal. And then you make, um, you try again, make another burst. Still not enough. Then a third burst. So you, this is the movement that, that you would produce. And depending on how much of this is lesioned, you, 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 know, you might make very tiny, 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 tiny saccades to get to this spot, if a lot of this was gone. But they all would be fast, because you still got a burst, and you still have a, a tonic activity, so they look sort of roughly in normal shape, but this would be a lot, lots of them, take you many cicads to get there. Okay, last one. You lesion this pathway, the pathway from the PPRF to these neurons. Would it be this one, this one, this one? Not very sure. I thought I heard a click for this one. Yes. Okay. So, you'd still make a movement because this tonic pathway is still intact. So, but it wouldn't be fast because you wouldn't have the burst. It's the burst that drives, turns the eye quickly. But you'd still gradually end up to where a normal cicad would take you, because you still have all this tone that holds the eye in that position. Okay, so that, that gives you a hint that knowing this stuff might be important. Okay. What initiates a saccade? So we got this burst. First of all, we have, we learned previously that from the superior collectivists and the frontal eye fields, there's a foveal zone. And while you're fixating, the, the foveal zone is active, and that's preventing saccades from happening. And it prevents saccades from happening by a connection to these neurons here, which, which are called omnipause neurons. And they in, inhibit your PPRF. So they keep this structure silent. And if this structure is silent, you don't turn your eyes. You just keep them where you've last made a saccade to. Now, to make a saccade, what happens is we saw that the hill of activity at the fovea must be, must disappear. And at the same time, a hill of activity, wherever you want to make the saccade to, has to appear somewhere in the superior colliculus. So this activity here, which something, some stimulus, or some thing that you want to move to, activates the superior colliculus. And that, in turn, inhibits the thing in the fovea, and this hill grows. That then removes the inhibition from the PPRF and just lets this excitatory signal through, which then produces this huge burst of activity. And your saccade takes off. 
Well, it takes off at a thousand exponentials per second. But then comes the question, what stops it? Okay. You've got this cat launch that's traveling something like about 900 degrees per second. That's 900, 900 degrees, that's three times around in one second if it continued turning. You know? What stops it? Well, the possibilities are one, vision. Okay? It could be a vision. But no, the vision would be too slow. By the time the signal gets to the just the visual cortex, it's 50 milliseconds. The average length of a, of a saccade, of a really long saccade, is about 50 to 100 milliseconds. So it would just see the, the, the target appearing and wouldn't, would, the, you still have to activate the muscles, contract or stop activating the muscle, and the muscle's activity has to cease. So that would be too, that would work. Another possibility is maybe there's receptors in these muscles, like there are in all your other muscles that sense maybe how far you've gone, and you use them as feedback. And for many years, people believed that was in fact what was true. But then they found that if in animal studies, that if these, if you lost all the innervation coming from these muscles, you'd still stop the saccade on target. There'd be no deficit whatsoever in terms of the saccade's accuracy. So what then might stop it? Well, surprisingly, it's this thing that stops it. Okay? Quad discharge. This thing is telling you what position, it, it holds the eye at a certain position, of course, then it has a signal proportional to eye position. Okay. So it is a good thing for the brain to use to, to, for it to, to, to signal what eye position you've gotten to. And as a consequence, adjust the signal to the spirit colliculus. So, yeah, uh, and so it it is what... what uh, the signal that the brain uses for this. The circuitry is still largely in dispute, but one possibility is a fellow by the name of Doug Munoz, who's, who, who's been in Queen's University now for over 30 years, and he proposed the theory that this signal here from the PBH goes to the superior colliculus, this crawler discharge signal goes to the superior colliculus. And it is what moves this hill from this spot to this spot. Okay. And then as that hill moves, it eventually gets to the, the fovea. And of course, when it gets to the fovea, those omnipause pause neurons turn on, and that stops the saccade. So it's a neat feedback circuit. Um, sort of like a, a guided, you can imagine the saccades are like a guided missile to get launched by the PPRF, and then stop by this feedback. The other thing that, that, that you might, might, might be, uh, realize is that this signal, go, this quality discharge is going to the colliculus, is also going up to the front line fields and the, the parietal line fields. Remember, the quality discharge went to these structures. So this is how this this uh, uh discharge is originated. This is a signal. This is a, a signal that's going to the eye muscles, but this is a copy of the signal that's going to the eye muscles. Okay, and we saw that in these early lectures that the signal went to the L. Once one part of it went through the LGN to the visual cortex. The other part went through directly to the spirit colliculus and to the PPRF. So this completes that circuit we uh, looked at at the very beginning of this course. And this is the, the, the circuit that's used to launch those express saccades. If, on the other hand, you want to make a voluntary movement, um, you use 
in your working memory of the prefrontal cortex, and you use your frontal eye field to uh, to generate that uh, target from working memory, and that signal then goes back to your spirit collectors and through the same circuit to launch this attack. But of course, this will take a longer time. Now, it's very important for the, these eye muscles to get the eye to exactly the same position. You've got this coral discharge that tells you, you know, okay, uh, the eyes are moving this much. But how do the muscle moves cells manage to execute the movement that is just the right size? Well, if you, you can do an experiment where, or just from natural uh, cases, this weakness occurs in, in, in a muscle. Let's say the, the needle rectus on this side. So this is making the normal size movement. You want to look at someone to your, to your left. This one's making a much smaller movement. And of course, you won't then be looking at the same target. You look at, want to look at your friend to your left. One eye will be looking at this eye, will be looking at, at that person. But this eye will be looking at somebody else, something else. You'll see have strabismus. You'll see double. Well, one of the things that's often done in cases of strabismus is that you surprisingly patch the good eye. You think you might patch the weak eye. But no, you patch the good eye. And if you do that, it forces this eye to try to look at whatever it is that you want to look at. So initially, it will just move a little bit. But with time, if this muscle is capable of it, it will eventually learn to make this a cat of the correct size. Okay. But then if you look at this eye, it's now moving too much because the same signal has gone to both eyes. Surprisingly, when we take the patch off, the brain again recalibrates, but this time we adjust only this eye. And that the recalibration is done by again the structure called the cerebellum, in particular the vermis part of the cerebellum. And so th this kind of recalibration occurs all the time, um, continuously for you. And if 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 for some reason it fails and you start seeing double, it might be two things that are wrong. One is that this muscle is so weak that no amount of recalibration can compensate for it. You can't produce enough drive to contract it. Or there's something wrong with your cerebellum and it is unable to do the recalibration. Okay. Nystagmus. This is what you felt when you turned your eye. Okay. Your eyes turned slowly in one direction and then went looking back in the opposite direction. And that's what's called nystagmus. And all of you that do a large turn of your head will see that. Now here it here's a turkey in my backyard, doing what's called head nystagmus. Yeah, they, 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 they've, somehow in the winter they come out of hiding. And uh, I've, I've seen them wandering around the last couple of days. And you can see a lot of birds do this type of movement. As they move, their head is stable in space and then flicks forward. Stable in space and then flicks forward. And that's, that's exactly what this nystagmus was doing. The eye is being stable in space and then flicking forward. In this case, the whole head is stable in space. So again, the vision is clear for the turkey while, while it's heading back like that. Now this is a normal VOR. What you saw there was VOR, saccades, VOR, 
the cat. That's a bunch of rapids the cat. So, and again, during each VOR, the eye is stable in space. So it's looking at some part of the room and everything is steady there. Why is it making these more rapid saccades? Well, that happens if you want to look in the direction that you're turning. Say I'm turning to the right. I want to look more to the right. So what you do is you make more frequent saccades in that direction. Now, we've got very similar saccades. It's the same uh, diagram as I had before. But there's something different about it. What's different? The head isn't turned. Okay. This, this, this. This is someone that's got this gangless, but no head turned. So there must be something wrong with this VOR, with the vestibular system. Can you guess what's wrong? Can anyone talk? Let's suppose, make it to simplify it. It, it, it is something to do with, with the horizontal canal. Okay. Is it the canal on this side or this side that's affected? The right or the left? Can anyone guess? Right. Okay. Let's. For, for, why is that? Okay. Um. Why? No, it's left. <laughs> it's left. Canal is affected. Sorry. Um. Why is that? Okay. When you turn to the right, you've got this distag. Okay. If you were head, the OR was normal, and you turn to the right, you would get this distag. When you turn to the right, the activity in this canal is higher than the opposite canal. Okay, so that, that pupil is bending in the right direction. That. So right is more than left. Well, how would you produce a normal view or an, a, an abnormal view or where without turning the head, right would be more than left? Well, by damaging the left side. So that you can't produce a lesion that increases the activity of some nuclear, but you can produce a lesion that decreases the activity of some nuclear. So it must be somewhere on the left. This is this is now we've got the stagmus here again, but it's different from what we saw before. You can see that you make a saccad this way, and it comes back. So can the album direction it comes back. So you see it drifting in both directions here. Plus the drift is not linear. So we saw it, it was sort of like in a straight line before. Now it's sort of exponential in nature. Well, that's caused again by our PPH. Remember it's sort of drift, you make a saccade, and if the level activity of PPH wasn't there, you drift back towards center. Well, this is exactly what's happening here. You've got a lesion somewhere in the PPH, or something somewhere in the flocculus to try to tune this PPH, and maintaining the tonic activity. Okay, the next movement we'll look at is virgins. You can see here the eyes making a virgins movement. Okay. Now, so what was different here is that you either got these lateral recti contracting to turn the eye to a far target, or you got the medial recti contracting to move the eye to a near target. It makes the cads we had a lateral and a medial recti contracting, or ones on the opposite side. So these are the muscles 
the same muscles contract to them both eyes. So that's what turns the eye. But there's all kinds of interesting things that happen while the eye is turning. You can see here is what the eye sees. You can see clear image, clear image. So in between, as the target moves away, you see that the image isn't clear. So that's because it's not, you've got, the lens isn't the right thickness. Remember, you have to change the shape of your lens to go from far to near. The other thing that you can see that's happening is this here is your pupil. What's happening is every time, just before you make each either convergence or divergence, your pupil contracts. The pupil becomes small. That's because at any one point, when, 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 when this target moves, jumps from not far to the it moves to a point that the lens isn't adjusted for. So you can't see clearly. So the brain tries to come up with the best strategy it can. It contracts your pupil and it increases your focal length. So you, things are clear over a larger focal length. The difficulty with that, of course, is when you close your pupil, you can't see as, as brightly. You don't have enough light sometimes. But that, that for the for the for the for vision, that's a, a price to pay in order to be able to see the target clear clearly. Now, the pathway um, uh, for 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 a very virgin system is a combination of what we didn't look at too was retinal disparity. So you can see when the target jumps each time, initially you've got retinal disparity, so a different image on both eyes. So that's a, one of the signals that drives a virgin's movement. Suddenly, you've got, for, instead of the one target, two targets appear of the same thing. It's a signal for the virgins to start going. So retinal disparity through the visual cortex will initiate a virgin's movement. And it'll also initiate a, a lens adjustment. Also, a blurring, as it jumped from near to far, the, the, the lens wasn't adjusted properly. So there was a blurring. So again, there's a circuit that drives the lens, lens adjustment, but uh, that also feeds to the virgin system. And you make the best movements when you've got a, both a blur and a retinal disparity. So both these things drive divergence, and both these things drive a lens adjustment. Okay, next let's look at pursuit. Now, we, we've studied almost all of this pathway. We, we've studied what happens in the brain stem. You, you activate those motor neurons that turn the eye muscles. And we've studied MSTL, when an object appears and you track it, um, which is what pursuit is, that's what's driving it, MSTL. So in between is the cerebellum. So this is the circuit that connects the two. And over here, it's retinal slip that's driving. After this, it's a command that drives pursuit. It's a pursuit command. You're telling it the, the, the eye to move at this speed. And what you see here is an example. Imagine you're looking straight ahead and this B, B is not flying. It's, it's just sitting there. The B takes off. What well, takes off now. Then you start pursuing it. It's still. Then you make a saccade, it's foveated, and then you maintain it at the fovea. Okay, let's look at that again. B starts to move, you pursue it, you make a saccade, 
phobia and you need hyperphobia. So you got this this you got delay because it takes the brain some time to react to this movie. movie um, the, you're pursuing it, but it's not in the phobia. Then you make a catch up cicad, which puts it on the phobia, and then with it on the phobia, you keep it stationary on that. Now, you can also, with effort, imagine that these two dots are like lights on a wheel. You can imagine the center of this wheel and just make a smooth pursuit movement across this thing. From here, your eyes will just go like that if they're doing this properly. And I'm moving my mouth. So even with seeing my mouth. You could, with training, be able to make that. If there was a sound that swept across the room, again, you could learn to track it. Or if you closed your eyes and you imagined your finger, imagine tracking your finger, you could learn to track it. Okay. So with practice, you can imagine these moving targets and you can drive your pursuit system. The last thing I want to talk about is what happens when you just fix it. You think you're stationary, but you're not. Okay? This is the back of the eye, back here. These are your rods and cones. And this is a letter A that you might be reading as a letter A of a word that you're reading. You think it's stationary in your eye, but it's not. All these, your eye is making these little tiny movements, which with respect to this A, is not tiny at all. Okay. And yet, you can see this A clearly. The most, other most remarkable thing is that if you somehow were able to measure how much your eye is moving, these small little tiny movements, and move the A in exactly the same amount, then you would stabilize this A on the back of the phobia. And when you did that, the A would disappear. Somehow we need these little tiny movements to keep the A visible. And how this happens, we have no idea. Okay. So, just to summarize again, we've got five, five types of eye movements. Two of them, the VOR and the optic nervous system, are trying to keep all the image, the whole image, everything on the back of the eye, stationary. Okay. So, that is not just somewhat you're looking at, but everything in the room, stationary. You need big images to drive these things. So the VOR, we saw it respond, responds quickly because it's got such a slow, re, short reflex. You could shake your head rapidly and still be able to read. If you turn your head for a long time, you get into problems because the cupola adapts, it goes back to its resting position, and your vestibular system senses that you're not turning, and it gets recalibrated by the cerebellum, as does most, most other movements. The other thing that helps it is this optokinetic system. And this kicks in during prolonged movements. That's because these, this reflex is very slow to get going. And so, the VOR does use, it, it, it picks things up when they're fast, and this thing contributes when things are slow. And again, you need something that covers the whole back of the retina to get this thing active, because that's what, it, what it's trying to do, trying to stabilize everything in the back of the eye. Now, in contrast, we've got this new system developed. It developed when a species developed the phobia. That's been late in the course of evolution. Um, 
the first uh, the species that evolved had uniform records. So you have, you have a phobia, you've got to keep your eye pointing at this phobia. And you use saccades, pursuit, and virgins to do it. Saccades to move to two targets, pursuit to keep your eye on a single target, and virgins when you move nearer or farther. You. All involved in phobia. And the saccades are very fast and also very accurate. The cerebellum retunes it. And you don't have any control over its speed. It's fast. No questions asked. Pursuit system, it requires a moving target unless you're well trained. Um, and, it, and it's slower than the VR if, if, uh, because it's got a longer pathway. And as a consequence, you can't, can't stabilize things if they shake a lot. Finally, we have the virgin system, which points both fovea at the target. That prevents double vision by plopia and turns the eye in the opposite directions. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week for the last lecture.